So uh, um, there we go. Um, so uh, an overview of, of function factories. So we're going to talk about what a function factory is, um, how how they make how you use a function to make more functions, uh, how that works with environments, and why it's a little bit different from a, a normally written function. Um, how uh, that interacts with lazy evaluation in R and how to make it interact politely with lazy, uh, lazy evaluation in R. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about John Harmon's factory package, which I think is super cool. Um, then we'll go on to some uh, practical applications of function factories. So uh, how to use it to write a stateful, uh, uh, a tool that remembers a state, um, how ggplot uses these and how a couple of other, a couple of other applications of them. And then finally, we'll wrap up with uh, tying function factories together with what we learned last time about uh, functionals. So I will be using these packages. Um, this, uh, um, I think, I think John's package is on CRAN now. I'm not sure, but you can install it with uh, from GitHub too. Um, okay, and I promised a meme, so we have some memes. So uh, um, I, I like the kind of inceptionist nature of of function factories and, and uh, functional programming. So we're going to take some functions and uh, we know you like functions. So we're going to take some functions, uh, put them in functions so that we make functions with our functions. And that'll make complete sense by the end of this, if it doesn't already. So, okay, so function factories. So uh, this takes advantage of the fact that functions are first, first class objects in R and that uh, a function will return whatever whatever objects it's producing or whatever the last object it produces, even if it's a function. So we can see here, we have a, um, a function um, called power that um, as its body um, defines a function that takes, uh, um, takes a parameter X and raises it to EXP, which we're giving in the, in the outer function here. So, uh, we can use that to produce functions that uh, that raise x to some power. So if we say let's make a function called um, called square that uh, um, has two for a value of the x speed, um, and a function called cube that uh, um, has three for the value of the x speed. If we run square uh, of eight, it does exactly what we'd expect, and it returns sixty four. Um, so, okay, so what's actually going on here? So let's do the obvious first and take a look at, at what the body of our function is, uh, which is completely uninformative because they are exactly the same for square and cube. So, okay, so this is already a little bit different from, from the normal functions that we're used to because we're, we're not seeing what the function is doing entirely defined within the function. Um, so, okay, so where, where is, are these functions getting the value of the XP from or the exponent? So to do that, we're going to use rlang. Uh, we can look at the uh, function environment of square um, and look at the value of the XP in that. Um, and likewise, we'll do the same thing with, uh, with cube. And you can see that's where these values are coming from. So for the square function, we're raising to the second power, the cube function, we're raising to the third power. Um, so, I think be, before I started, we were talking about how uh, um, function factories are kind of, you know, the, the, the basic concept of using functions to generate other functions is pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of little details that are, are confusing. And please stop me at any point if I get any of this wrong. Um, so, okay, so where, does, where are we getting EXP from? What's actually um, happening? Yeah, yes, but I have a question, please. Sure. Um, the previous slide. Oh. Yeah, so um, while assessing the and the values of two and three, which format is this in R using a function and you use this dollar sign and expression, which how I don't get the format of using a function, then dollar sign some variable, oh. which format is that? Okay, so uh, so what's happening here is we're calling the, um, the fn n function from Arlang mm -hmm. um, on, on that function square one and then mm. Um, I, I should have done more looking into what this actually does, but I, what it's doing, what's, what FNNV is doing is returning an object that has um, all of the environment of, ah. of that function. Mm. So then, okay. you know, like, it, like any other environment, we can look at elements of, mm. elements of that list by uh, mm. using the dollar sign operator. 
okay, then we can ex and extract the X XP value from the environment, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what that's that's what's going on there. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay, so where where is this actually coming from? Um, and I find these diagrams a little bit confusing. I put it in here to, to fill up the slide, but what my interpretation of what's going on here, and again, please correct me if I'm if I'm messing this up, is that um, our manufactured function is uh, looking for a value of exp. It's not defined within the function body. So by the rules that we learned for uh, um, in the functions chapter, um, it looks one step up. So one step up is this function environment that uh, um, I think was created when we created the function. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. This is a, so it one step up from the function environment is the global environment. So it's getting the value of VXP from, from the global environment. Um, so he, here's where I get a little bit confused. So um, actually, maybe it's best if I, if I talk about how this can bite us and then come back to it and see if we see if that makes this clear. Um, OK. So all right, so we're creating functions. We're um, the way that we're getting some of the parameters of the functions that we're creating is a little bit different from, from how we normally do. Um, so that works 99% of the time, but this can get you into trouble with, with uh, R's lazy evaluation and promises. So um, it's good to kind of think to yourself, okay, if I'm using function factories, I need to be careful of lazy evaluation, just be aware of, of how that works. So let's take this example. Uh, if we assign uh, two to X, and then we create our square function um, using X. So your kind of uh, um, your procedural brain will say that okay, well, surely X has the value of, of two here, which is our exponent. So that'll be a, a perfectly good square function. But now, what happens if we assign three to X after creating our square function? What do we think that that square will return? So our, our kind of procedural brain, not not thinking about lazy evaluation would say, okay, well, of course it got the value two for exponents, so it'll square the number. But if we run this now, we get eight. So clearly something is, is amiss with that, that straightforward model. Um, so what's actually happening here? So what's happening is that uh, because of R's lazy evaluation, the value of EXP isn't evaluated until it's needed. And creating that square function doesn't need to know the value of the XP. So R waits to calculate that until it's actually needed to, to produce output. Um, so the, the upshot of this is that function factories aren't complete. The functions that function factories build aren't complete until the user runs them, unless you do something to require that everything in them is evaluated when they're being created. So okay, so how do we how do we fix this? Uh, the easiest way is by forcing evaluation while we're while we're using our factory to create functions. So this is our same function factory with the addition of this force line. Um, all this does is it tells R to evaluate exp, and it would be exactly the same thing as if we put exp on a line by itself because R would have to evaluate it in order to in order to complete that line of code uh, using the the force function. Uh, is just a way to tell you as somebody reading this function later that that's what that's that's what we're explicitly telling R to do. Um, okay, so now everything will work here because we've uh, oops, thought I had a slide for how it actually worked. Um, but uh, so now if we went back and did the example again where we uh, defined this function and, and then defined so if we define the value of of exp um, as two and then we um, ran this function to create our, our, our uh, square function um, and then define the value of XP as three and ran this, um, ran, ran our created square function, we would get the right answer out of it because the value of the XP was evaluated while we're creating our function here. Um, so uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, John Harmon, uh, I think when he was presenting this chapter for the first uh, advanced R group, um, I don't know if you wrote it concurrently with this, but you wrote a package to, to do this stuff. Um, and it's kind of cool because it does this in a nicer way than, than just using the force. Um, I'm not going to go into details here because uh, the 
tools that he uses to do that we'll discuss a little bit later in chapter 19. Um, but within this uh, build factory, uh, so within the, the, the factory package, the build factory is our is a function factory. It's, it works as a drop in for how we've been creating functions with function factories, except it does a little bit of processing behind the scenes. Um, so we have the same same uh, power function creator um, here and um, so when we run it, we will run that same test where we're trying to fool it into being a square a cube function instead of a square function. Um, not only does it give the right answer, if we show the body of the square function that we've created using the, the, the uh, uh, build factory, it actually has the right function body, the function body that a user would expect to see when they when they look at that to see what the code does. So I, I really like this. So I think that if you know if you have a use for function factories, this is really worth looking into. Um, and because I don't really understand quasi notation yet, uh, this appears to be magic to me, which is uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Okay, so as promised, more memes. This one doesn't really fit here, but I, I kind of view function factories as kind of an inception thing that you're um, you know, having these nested things that are creating things for you behind the scenes. All right. So one application is creating stateful functions. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're making a function to make counters. So our function sets a, a counter variable to zero. Um, and then the output of this function is a function that um, iterates i and stores it in the global environment. That's the, the double assignment operator. And then returns the value of it. So if we run this, um, we, we can uh, create two counters, counter one and counter two. Counter one, the first time it's run, will give a value of one. The second time it's run, will give a value of two and so on. And counter two will start it by giving a value of one and so on and so forth. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is we've been talking about functional programming. And I'll ask the question, um, are these counters pure functions and or good functional code? You know, anybody wants to chime in. I have a, what I think is the answer to this, but. Okay, I would, I would say yeah. they're definitely not. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, like I don't think so. Like, I mean, you would think it is because it returns something, but if it messes with the environment, I don't think so. Yeah, so uh, um, that's that's one reason right there is that it, uh, it, has, it has a side effect that it changes the global environment. Mm -hmm. um, and another reason why it's it's not a pure function is that uh, the same input will not give the same output every time. So yeah. we're giving it no parameters and we're getting an iterated value every time. So it's we're using functional program, programming to make things that aren't functional programming. I thought that was just kind of interesting. Yeah. But, um, why is it also called stateful functions? Oh, it's a uh, it's called stateful because it's a, it's a it's a way to maintain state within a function. So, um, and this is this is like because I'm almost entirely you know um, because I'm almost almost all the programming I do is uh, uh, is data science where you're not really thinking about states so or you're not really writing state machines and things like that. I'm not as familiar with this. Um, but um, I would call it stateful because the function, well, that's, that's actually interesting. The function doesn't know the state of I, but because it's storing it in the global environment, it can use that. Um, and then actually, here's another good question about this that I, um, just occurs to me that I don't understand. Um, since it's, since the double assignment is storing in the global environment, um, doesn't the value of i get overwritten by counter one versus counter two? And I think the answer to that is that double assignment is not assigned to the global environment, it's assigned to one environment up. But maybe somebody can correct me on that. No, exactly. That's like it, it, it's it searches the tree and it starts with the best next one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so sorry about that misinterpretation initially. <laughs> And it's right. stateful because it remembers something. So you're saving something in the function. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So typically in a in a um, 
typically because of the, the fresh start, uh, we wouldn't be storing anything in a functions environment because it's created new every time. Um, and also for, for pure functions, we don't want to store anything in the functions environment because we don't we want that function environment to be clean and be the same every time when we run the function. Okay, that aside done. We'll move on to some, uh, some uh, applications of uh, um, function generators uh, within, within commonly used R packages. Um, so, okay, so ggplot has a lot of, uh, a lot of functions that accept functions as argument, as arguments. So if we look at uh, geom histogram, we'll see that uh, um, the bin width can be the width of the bins. Um, it can be specified as a numeric or as a function that calculates the width from the value of X. Um, so we can use that to our advantage. So let's say in the example in the book that we have um, three very three just three uh, um, data sets with very different uh, standard deviations. Um, if we plot those with a with a free, if we use if we plot those as facets with a uh, uh, with the x-axis free to be what it wants to be, we'll get these uh, uh, wildly different plots uh, because the deviation is much wider as we go to the right. Um, so let's say we want to have these be um, all with the same number of bins, even though they have a very different distribution. So if we want to do that, we can use a, um, a function factory to make our bin widths. So this function uh, bin width bins, um, you can see the use of force here to make sure that we're not, um, that we're not uh, um, having any lazy evaluation issues. Uh, we're taking the, uh, the maximum minus maximum of the um, of the distribution minus the minimum of the distribution um, divided by the number of samples to normalize the um, the the bin widths. So when we run this again using this uh, um, bin with bins, oh sorry, n is the number of bins. I'm sorry, not the number of samples. Um, so if we if we run our our histogram again. Um, defining the bin width as, with our bin with bins function with 20 bins. Um, this will neatly bin all of our data into 20 bins regardless of its distribution. So all these distributions look the same. They should look like a normal distribution just with different standard deviations. Um, I would argue it, since it's been drilled into me since, since uh, college that we don't use different axes for the same data that this is a bad idea. But if you're trying to show that, that each of these have a normal distribution, that's a a good way to do it without a lot of um, a lot of hacking around with bin widths individually for each plot. Okay. Uh, so the scales factory has a ton of function factories. Um, this is an example of the number format function. Um, you can see we're feeding in a bunch of um, a bunch of parameters. Uh, we're forcing all the parameters so that we're not having any lazy evaluation issues, and then we're creating a function that takes um, a vector in, and it formats it using all the uh, um, the using the number function with all the parameters that we fed in, and giving you a formatted uh, numeric a formatted vector out. So, um, okay, and now the final bit of this is uh, combining this with functionals to create to use use function factories to create a bunch of functions at once. Um, so let's say uh, we wanted to um, know the square, the cube, um, the square root, the cube root, and the reciprocal of, of a vector of numbers all at once. We can do this with our function factory by using, by mapping, so by defining a list of uh, exponents that we want to use, um, and then using map to um, to map that list of list of exponents onto our function factory, giving us a, a list of functions essentially. Um, so now we have this this object that contains uh, that contains functions for square, cube root, cube root, and reciprocal. So if we we can call these by uh, by using the dollar notation to get the list number that we want out of the list. So our funds object that we've created, we can get the root function um, by dollar root and then uh, um, give it a number to take the root of and you can see it works. Uh, if we look at that function, 
you can see it's it's just like the, those first batch of uh, function factories, those factory created functions that we created in that it doesn't really tell you what it's doing. So if we were to do this with the uh, um, um, with John's package, we, we would see that each of these had, had a different um, had a different function body. Um, so this raises the question how to avoid dollaritis, uh, which uh, we'll most of us are probably familiar with already. Um, I think the safest way is with. So um, it's very short-lived. It only it only it, it only de-dollarizes us for the duration of the of the of the call to with. So anything within that call, you don't need to use dollars with. But as long as that once that call's done, uh, it's not in the global environment. So if we want to take uh, if we want to just use the root function, we can say okay with with object functions. Um, grab the grab the root um, the root member of that list and and run it with the um, to get the square root of 100 and get 10. Uh, a more permanent way to do this is uh, everybody's if, everybody, if people have been programming in R for a while they may remember the attached days. Um, I used to be an attached fanatic and I was cured of this at some point thankfully. Um, if you're unfamiliar with it, attach uh, takes an object and attaches it to the global environment. It's, this, it's the same way that, that with works, except it's permanent until you, until you detach that function. So back in the, in the good old days, it was uh, used for attaching uh, data tables or, or data frames. So typically you'd attach your data frame and then you could work with the columns without using dollar notation. Um, tidyverse has made that um, completely unnecessary. Um, and it was also kind of dangerous because you'd have all these variables in your environment um, that could write over other variables. They could interact with, yeah, it was just a, not a, not a great idea unless you were very careful with it. But here we can use that to attach all of the members of the functions list. So once we do that, we have all of the functions inside of that, that functions object available in the, in the uh, global environment. Um, and at the end, you always want to detach it. Uh, there was a third case in the text. Uh, it used, again, it used the stuff from chapter 19, so I'm not going to go over that here. Um, it also seemed like potentially the most dangerous of the three. Um, so maybe we can revisit that when we get to uh, um, quasi notation and, and things like that. And I think that is all I have. So thanks very much. Right. That's his chapter. Yeah, so we could spend some time looking at exercises. I'm happy to attempt to answer questions. That means you didn't do it. <laughs> I did the exercises, most of them. Not all okay. the ones with the, the end of the chapter, but. Um, I just want to say the uh, scales thing was a mind blower for me. Um, I've been using that function for a really long time, right? Like scale x continuous labels equals number format. Like I've been using that for a very long time. Didn't know it was a function factory. Yeah, it, I think they kind of pop up in places that you, you know, you kind of just think of something as working. And, you know, I, I think that's one thing, nice thing about the advanced R in general is you kind of like now seeing how all these things actually work makes them more clear to at least to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, also Hadley said like um, they are not terribly useful, the functional factories, they are not used many um, uh, as other functionals. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I I think the stateful thing and everything there are classes just so much better if you use a class and not a, a function so yeah okay i think in the exercises they are we're also talking about um yeah they were talking about uh, um making that counter example and um making it as a um, not as a function factory. So just, uh, um, 
yeah, just, just making them one off. And it seemed to perform the same way. But that was kind of interesting. You know, and also like thinking about thinking about the stateful thing, like how you handle that in a in a functional programming paradigm. I mean, the, the object oriented thing is is the is the way to do that because the you know the whole point of an of a uh, um, of an instance of an object is that you can store state in it. You can store how the you know what the what the uh, um, parameters of that object are. And the next chapter will be John, right? Yep, that's me. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ross. I think. Um, oh. Did someone finish the math example? There was one crazy math example in this chapter, I think, with some transformations with the box Cox transformation and that stuff. I, ju oh, I, just, oh. I just jumped it because they say you need math knowledge and I have no math knowledge at all. <laughs> yeah, I guess they did box Cox with a function factory too. Yeah. I hardly was even saying that one can skip this section if <laughs> you are not familiar with the stats. But John is familiar with the stats. Oh, I'm not. You are because you're in that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like the method that they use there, though. The, you know, it's a, it's not super common, but in the stuff I do, it's, um, I'll tend to have things where I want to look at look at the how a parameter effects occur. Um, and in the past, I've just done that, you know, iteratively, iteratively by saying, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to run my function once with this variable, once, you know, once, once with this value, once with this value, um, and then once with this value. And I really like this functional approach to it because it's just, it's a lot nicer. Mm -hmm. So I, I can, you know, that's like, yeah, I was trying to think of like, where would I use function factors? And I think that's one place where I could go back and, and redo that. Um, you know, in this case, it's a exponential dilution model. So you're, you know, you're um, adding adding a gas to another gas, um, and figuring out what the what the concentration of each gas is over time. And it's it's just like an exponential, but the initial the the rate of ad addition and things like that um, make a difference in what the curves look like. Um, I just want to ask a question, but it's not related to the, this chapter. I was, I, I'm just doing some analysis, but I was Googling and I can't find that. Um, so um, I'm reading um, some text in Portuguese and they have some kind of accented form. But when I use read CXB, some text return to become some kind of a readable format. Like um, I just share some, I don't know how to come. I just share with you some so, so this know. is when you're this is when you're importing a CSV. Yes. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a it's a character set thing. I've seen this happen um, a couple times before. I think it's like I'm trying to remember what the details are, but uh, um, I think it's a UTF-8 versus ASCII thing, probably. Yeah. Um, so I went to the UTF-8. Yeah, UTF-8 UTF doesn't have the letter, so that's mm -hmm. why it's it's printed like this. So you need to change from UTF-8 to something else. Yeah. So I went to our studio and they have been under preference. They have some kind of um, the code. Um, is it display all savings? Yeah. So there is default text encoding. So I change it from uh, UTF-8 to some stuff I saw in the internet, but they didn't work yet. Still, when I read it, then. I don't know. I will check later. I think there was a Latin one. Uh, like I'm yeah. Canadian, so I work with like French a lot. And yeah, yeah, I think the Latin one works. Okay, well, okay, the Latin one, right? Yeah. Ah, I have not selected that one. I think I will try it. Thank you, John. 
it's um Shem, is it is it all of the if is it all of the CSV that that looks messed no. up, or is it just when those characters show up? Yeah, yeah, those only those characters that they have some kind of accented form. Okay. The Portuguese. Okay, that's a little different yeah. than what I was what yeah. I was talking about. Not yeah, it's all. like when an ampersand shows up as a slash amp, right? That thing. I think but, that's UTL. But John, they do have um, um the Latin different Latin Latin nine Latin four Latin one. So yeah, I have no idea. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but but can't you only set it for the import? So don't change completely R Studio. Only, ah, okay. Only Is it local? Import. Yeah, local. I, I think I, I think you can set it for the import. What what kind of thing you want? Okay. Yeah, in the in the call from read CSV. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it should be a line of code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can change that one. But yeah, that's stuff that can break really ugly because i had the database a really big one and then some new user came with some russian thing and it broke my complete my database because some new characters mm. okay yeah i have done that before but i will go back and definitely change that one all right <laughs> 